Hello, Davey here. Welcome to this Ultimate Noctua NF A9 X14 spray painting guide. Now, before I get into disclaimers, and disclaimers unfortunately need to be done these days on the tiniest of things because people will complain about the smallest of things unless you point it out before them. So, first things first, here are some shots about the original fan or of the original fan and comparing them to shots of the painted finished article. There's no point in me saying wait till the end of the video because you can just skip there and see it yourself. If you wanted to see a spray painted Noctua fan, then here you go. So, on to the disclaimers. First things first, this is a long video. This is not a short entertainment sort of video, this is more of a tutorial style video, more information packed, less entertainment value. It's more so that if you actually really wanted to do this, you can get all the little nuggets of information about all the little bits of parts inside your Noctua fan, just so you're aware of them and you know what to avoid and what you should aim for. So, it's very much tutorial based, not very much entertainment based, and if you don't like it, then you should probably move on and try and find something else. Good luck with that, there's not a lot around on it. Anyway, second disclaimer is that there are pretty much many ways of doing many different things in life. So, like those things, you can do this in many different ways, possibly. You can take the advice that I give, you can take the techniques that I use to successfully do this, and then maybe extrapolate them and improve on them, or maybe just replicate them and duplicate them and do them yourself and get a similar result. So, don't shout at me for saying you should have done this, because if it works, then it's okay. And I did learn a lot about fans through lots of different ways, a lot about this specific fan and all its internals in lots of specific ways that will actually help you that necessarily didn't help me first time round. So we'll get onto that in a second. Third disclaimer is, Christ, I have to do this because people will nitpick about the smallest things, and yes, this means that people like you, who actually want to see the damn video, have to wait for me to talk, or just skip forward, skip past them, you're probably about 30 seconds forward and you'll be fine, but I could have lit some of the shots that, or some of the scenes that I was doing better, I could have brought my softboxes down into the environments that I was working in, other than the main environment I work in, which is this room. I could have cleared the entire garage out and had more space to work, uh, I could have done a multitude of different things, I could have taken a week off work in order to make sure everything was perfect but in the interest of saving time I didn't so there's no need to tell me in the comments that all oh, the lighting was really bad in that shot because I mean there are only a few scenes that are that bad but generally you know it's it's acceptable people have to take shortcuts in life sometimes just to make sure that they can get things done so that was some of the steps I took and then lastly Thank you very much for watching this video. I really appreciate the support. And if you want to support this channel in any way, look to the end of the video and I'll just explain a few different ways or all the different ways that you could potentially support this channel. So thanks for watching this video and I will catch you in a second to kick off with the disassembly. Also, one quick thing, I am just adding this in, I forgot to mention it before, and I'm sorry for the jarring change in scene, I am testing the original performance compared to the painted fan's performance to see if there's any degradation or loss there, so you can work out whether it's, you know, right or wrong to do this. So, yes, on to the video. Before we can do anything, you're going to need to acquire yourself a heat gun. The one I've purchased for this task has three heat settings, being 50 degrees Celsius, 400 degrees Celsius, and 600 degrees Celsius. I was lightly using the 400 degrees Celsius here and there, since 50 degrees Celsius wasn't enough. The first real step of disassembly is removing this small black plastic clip holding the group of wires in place. Just prying at the underside with a smooth thin implement to push the posts out will do, and then using the extra leverage to pop it out from the top, and now the wire is free. Then the aluminium Noctua badge can be taken off the back. You'll want to use a little heat for this step since it's fixed to the frame with adhesive. I'm sure you could get this off without any heat, but you'd reduce the effort needed to remove it by adding heat, and this reduces the chance of damaging anything. Now comes the most stressful part of the disassembly, which is of course removing the fan blades from the frame. This is the most unknown part you'll have seen until you've seen it being done, since there's little indication about what is behind the hub. You want to be using the most heat at this point in the disassembly. I was using the 400 degrees Celsius setting for the most part here, and the blades took the heat pretty well on the whole. As a guide of how to do this yourself, I was holding the heat gun at about 15 centimeters away from the hub at 400 degrees C for about 15 seconds, but I'd recommend either around 300 degrees for 15 seconds or 400 degrees for 10 seconds for reasons we'll get onto in a second. After that blast of heat has been introduced, you can then wiggle the fan blades off using a moderate amount of force. Remember, we're pushing against plastic, and the spokes aren't that beefy. Don't be too shy about an unbalanced force being applied here, it'll prevent you from overloading the spokes and doesn't bend anything inside. After about 20 seconds of wiggling the fan blades away from the frame, the blades should pop off with a small assembly attached to the centre. 
Looking at the other side of the fan blades reveals why I would recommend a little less heat than I mentioned before, or a further application distance, or even 10 seconds of heat over 15 seconds of heat. Notice how there is a slightly melted leading edge of the fan blade adjacent to the marker on the hub. That's why I'd recommend reducing the heat somehow from 400 degrees C for 15 seconds, but it's not too bad so we can continue. To remove the motor, or correct me if I'm wrong, the stator from the frame, you just need a thin piece of plastic to pry it from the centre post. It's only being held in place with friction and there's no adhesive used here. So, as with the fan blades, you just need to tackle opposing sides a little at a time and it will come off eventually, without any damage done. Then it needs completely removing so we can take a closer inspection of where we are so far. At this point you should have a mostly stripped down frame that only needs a couple more pieces removing like the rubber pads, and the fan blades with the centre assembly in place sitting on your work surface. I want to go through a couple of close up shots just so you can double check what stage we're at, or at least know what to expect when you're planning to do this yourself. You should also have the PCB with the attached stator section of the motor completely removed from the frame. It's worth reiterating that you should only use plastic implements to get the PCB out to reduce the risk of scratching the tracers on the back. Also be wary of, correct me if I'm wrong, the H-bridge module bridging the cutout on the PCB. Next, the rubber pads can be removed, again using a rounded implement like the screwdriver I'm using to prevent scratching up the plastic below. These come off very easily since they're only held in place with some adhesive, but the adhesive could cause its own problems for layers of paint if remaining stuck to the frame, so ensure this is cleaned up before spraying. As for this centre post on the fan blades, it's not essential to remove it at this point, but it's the easiest time since the only other opportunity will be once it's painted, and avoiding this sort of tinkering then is advisable. You can try to remove it with your fingers and some sideways force, but you'll be more likely to remove your nail from your finger than this assembly from the blades. So without a doubt, the quickest way to remove it is to gain some leverage underneath with a plastic implement, and it should just pop off. For this reason, I don't recommend doing this over a sink, or at least put the plug in first. I actually tried to do the maths on how fast it travelled, and I found the result to be a disappointing 1.39 meters per second, or a more disappointing sounding 3.11 miles per hour, which according to Wikipedia is the average human walking speed. Hmm, uh, I think we might have gone off topic. So after a brisk jog, I caught up with the component that walked off, and it looks a little like this. From what I can tell, it's a steel post with a copper module attached and has an embedded rubber washer on the fan side and a nylon washer to the other side. Store this away safely with the PCB and the rubber pads since we'll be needing all of this later. Now we need to prep the surfaces we're painting. The best way to do this is to follow the instructions from the paint product that you intend to use, but a pretty solid way to clean up some unpainted plastic, such as this, is to use some basic washing up liquid and some elbow grease. I found that using a scouring brush was an excellent way to get into the cracks and crevices. Now, you may have noticed that there wasn't anything inside the centre post of this frame, and there actually are a few things that exist within that centre post. We'll go over those components during the assembly phase, but just so you know, it doesn't matter whether you leave them in or take them out, but if they're still in there and you're at this stage, you need to make sure that you're covering the drain so they don't fall out and get lost. After the soapy cleaning phase, you're going to need to rinse all these components out really thoroughly to make sure all of the chemicals are removed from the surface of the components. Paint is not going to react well to any impurities. So once you've given the fan blades and the frame a solid clean, they need to be dried out. You can just give them a wipe over with a paper towel and you'll also need to leave them to dry for a good 24 hours in a relatively dust free and well ventilated area. Or you can do what I did and give them a good drying down with some sort of hairdryer or in my case a motorized PC duster. So with the fan frame and the blades completely clean and dried out, you can then create some sort of mount for both of them so you can paint with some sort of freedom. I've used a couple, or as you'll see later, a few variations of mounting the components. One of the main ways I used was using an old tripod with a steel rod fixed to it. It seemed like a great idea to begin with, and it was, but it wasn't as versatile as the second option I tried. But, before I get too far ahead of myself, on to mounting the frame to the tripod base contraption. Initially, I covered the centre post with masking tape to ensure no paint would get between the teeth or inside the post. I then held the frame up to the steel rod and bridged the gap between the two with more masking tape. The day was getting on, so I managed to get a first coat in. However, the choice in paint wasn't as good as I'd like, and I'll cover more of that later on. Get it? Cov cover? Anyway. Okay, so checking out the result of actually two coats of paint uh, came back last night at about uh, 12 o'clock at night. First coat I did was around about 
eight thirty, eight o'clock, so it had a good four hours to dry, and they do say uh, a good two hours between coats, so that's had uh, its time. So. With the second coat, we've got pretty much full coverage, apart from the little cracks and crevices here and there, such as to the edges of the frame, there's these slits, uh, these sort of double slits that, uh, that are a little difficult to get to, uh, and there's also a little bit more to do around the base underneath what will be the motor, uh, the motor hub. Um, essentially, uh, and there's little bits between the in the screw sort of sections, so the screw in section. So um, those are the bits we need to target with the third coat, but if the third coat goes on well, that might be the last coat we need. Uh, this has just got a lot of little cracks and crevices that need covering. If we didn't have to cover those, I think we'd be pretty much there, to be honest. Uh, but there are just little bits here and there that need touching up. So I'm going to do that now, and then we'll get ready to sort the fan out clearly looked like I had enough paint there. So after adding an extra coat of paint to target the more awkward parts of the frame, it's time to move on to the fan blades. I thought it would be a good idea to weigh the blades first to get a good idea of how much extra mass we're adding for the motor to deal with afterwards. It looks like it weighs between 22 and 23 grams depending on how the weighing scale feels at the time. As for mounting the fan to another steel rod while the frame is drying, I used a similar approach and even though this tactic looks flimsy, and it was, it did work. But there is a better way which, as much as many people dislike, so to keep on track, we'll discuss later. Whatever way you decide to mount your fan, I'd recommend mounting it in a way that creates some sort of clutch on the centre sections of the components. These are the parts that won't interfere with spraying and won't be seen after the reassembly. I could use a wire hook through one of the screw holes on the fan's frame, but then I'd need to deal with the unpainted line created by the hook, and avoiding it like this is easier overall. So after a few layers of paint on each of the components, here are the finished articles. For an all-purpose matte finish paint from Rust-Oleum, it left a surprisingly glossy finish, but overall the coverage on the frame and the blades was good. But as mentioned earlier, there were some areas that were difficult to paint, such as the double slits on the sides of the frame and the recess around the screw holes as well as the screw holes themselves. The important thing now is to work out how much weight we've added to the fan blades, and the golden number is 1 gram. That's it, just 1 gram. I did pick it up and put it back on to see if 24 grams would appear, but no, we went from 22 grams to 23 grams, just 1 gram more. I then rebuilt the fan to completion, and then decided to disassemble it in order to coat both the frame and the blades with lacquer for increased durability, and then this happened. So the plan changed. I removed the NF-A9X14 fan from the NHL9X65 cooler, and then proceeded to paint that like you've seen so far. I also purchased a new NF-A9X14 to replace it. Now I'm just as disappointed in myself for wrecking what was a perfectly working fan. Well, I never got to test it, but we can assume it would have worked. Anyway, the big problem with me trying to disassemble it that caused the spoke to break was the lack of heat which expanded the clutch on the copper assembly. I didn't want to run any heat through the paint since it felt a little tacky, you know, sticky. For some reason it didn't and still hasn't dried out properly after one week. So this time round I was using a different paint, this time I was using car paint, which is still designed to be used on plastic and was actually a little cheaper than the first paint at only £8. I also wanted to quickly point out that if you haven't used spray paint before, make sure you spray in complete strokes across the component, starting each stroke before encountering the components and finishing the stroke once you've completely passed the component. And once you've finished spraying and you're waiting for the paint to dry, flip the can upside down and spray until you see clear gas. This clears the internals of the nozzle out so you won't have paint dry inside it and make it cease to work. To save everyone time, we're not going to watch the respray process again, and we'll move on to the assembly process. But something for you to catch up on is that I've given the new fan and frame between 3 to 5 coats of paint, and I've given them both 3 layers of lacquer to increase the durability of the finish. So now you join me here explaining one of the delays I encountered during this project. Um, but this sort of delayed one as well. I did have the fan frame on there which which had the um, mounting head and a pole and it was doing there so I could spray around and stuff with a good variance of uh, reach but that was 
and is now sort of broke. Uh, it was run over. I'm skipping past a lot of stuff now, but it's nothing that can't be quickly explained. What you're seeing here now is the rearranging of two half systems. The black case on the left contains the power supply unit and drives, and the test bench contains the motherboard, CPU, RAM, and graphics card. The black system is essentially supplying power and data to the test bench, and this was done purely to save time on my part. Now onto the reassembly. This is absolutely crucial and isn't just a case of throwing everything back together. First step is to free up the blades and frame from their respective mounts. This time round I was using a more substantial clutch mechanism to keep them all in place, which was more secure, especially for the blades. I also used blue tack to keep them in place. If you do the same, you're probably already aware that the best thing to remove blue tack is more blue tack. However, there was a little more work to do to the frame before moving on. Okay, so before I go any further, there is a tiny little bit of scuffing on the inside here. You might be able to slightly make it out. If I turn the ISO way the hell down, you can see the scuffing there much more, much more easily. So I'm just going to very, very gently just scrape away the edge of the inside. Don't need to do much at all. Just need to make sure it's enough to uh, just to guarantee it's not having any effect. There you go. So that's a little bit there. And... That's pretty much all I need to do. Perfect. And I'll just take that away. So there we go. Uh, so that's that. The inside you can see is, is already maintained within its own piece there. But I just want to go over very quickly the components that are in there and what order they go in. Because that's a super important bit that people might miss, um, uh, get the wrong idea of if they do this themselves. Okay, so that, that little centre assembly there, if I throw that back into view... That center assembly there, that has, uh, it's essentially like a little tube and you throw three things down into that, although you want to make sure they're sort of one kit before you throw them in. And that little assembly consists of that very tiny bit of what is what feels like some sort of silicon um, disc. Then there's a small magnet and then there's this unit here, this, this ring here, which is actually uh, asymmetrical. So it's more of a tube this way round, and then it's more of a sort of lid the other way round. So if I rotate that over, what you want to do is the first thing is you want to rotate it over so you're putting things into that tube. And we're, so this is upside down now, so we need to flip it over before we put it in. So you want to put this centre disc inside there first. So now I've got this little magnet here, I need to throw that magnet into there. And then that creates the assembly there. So now that is flush with the top now, and that's how it should be. So when you rotate that over... You can see that's the assembly you have there. And if we compare that with the with what we can see inside, you can see there that that is how it should be. So if this accidentally comes out when you're doing your works and that sort of stuff, then no problem, you can put it back together. It's not an issue. Uh, it's very hard to actually tell what the order is because if you're using pliers or tweezers to get them out, I wouldn't use pliers, if you use tweezers to get them out, then you might actually end up um, uh, uh, disorganizing the order because of the magnetism. You then want to put a very small amount of oil into the centre post. I've heard that sewing machine oil works perfectly for this job. I'm using a multi-purpose oil that's designed to work for a broad range of materials without breaking them down. One very small drop is all that is required and realistically what I've put in here is too much, but it'll do the job. As for replacing the PCB with the stator part of the motor, this is as simple as working the wire into its position, then making sure you're aligning all of the teeth of the stator component with the teeth on the frame's housing, and then push down gently until it's down as far as it can go. Then what you don't want to do is replace the centre assembly of the fan blades and push the blades back into position. That just creates problems. Strap yourself in for a journey of further discovery. To preface what's about to come, I had completely rebuilt at this point and I just finished all of the benchmarks to compare against the original fan. Okay, so I've pretty much finished the testing and there was one thing that was slightly irritating during the testing was there was a slight sound of rubbing, uh, like a... that sort of thing. A slight sound of rubbing like that, but uh, a, higher, a higher RPM or higher um, frequency of, of the rubbing, and it was very slightly annoying. And one thing that I actually noticed was I haven't got the the actual fan blade. Uh, the fan blade for this is over there. I've sort of I've taken it off. It came off very easily, and I noticed uh, that it came off very easily because uh, with the original one, the ability to push the fan blades out. Uh, is not very strong. You can you can probably push it out maybe a millimetre uh, and that's all it'll shift if you push from the back. But for some reason, this unit 
is having a bigger problem than that. I'll see if I can represent that now. So if I put these tweezers on there, tweezers, pliers, you can see that there is much more substantial movement there. It's probably easy to see that way. Much more substantial movement there. And that's that's irritating. I think that has some has somewhat to do with uh, this, uh, this sort of rubbing uh, noise because there seems to be something out of place in there. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna heat up this central area and use the pliers to pull that central slot out with this uh, uh, sort of copper node in the center. This is a high risk thing because we basically finished the project and this is me just getting curious to try and work out what exactly the problem is and perhaps maybe we'll learn something extra from it uh, or it'll be improved and it might even break but I've done all the testing and that's fine and it comes out as expected so this would only be an improvement uh, on, the, uh, on the mod. So let's see how it goes. To prevent the frame from lifting during this procedure, I taped it to the desk, of course having a layer of paper to prevent the tape directly sticking to the frame, and yes, I do know paper is flammable, don't need to remind me. Okay, that is the mounting pressure that we need, so the rubber's keeping it in place, that is holding nicely down to it, so I am going to start heating and pulling away. I'm going to put these gloves on just as some sort of heat protection, but not really relying on them. That is definitely a hard nut to crack. Okay, so that really didn't work as well as I'd wanted it to. I didn't want to put any more heat through it, and I think I was pulling way too much than I should be. Too much pressure, not enough heat, but I don't want to put more heat than that, otherwise it might end up causing issues with the paint finish, or f end up making it even easier to flex these uh, these spokes in the wrong direction and have them uh, in sort of a more bent out fashion, which would mean that the blades of the fan would be riding higher by a few millimeters than I want them to. And that's gonna affect, you know, the um, airflow and all that sort of stuff. So, what I want to do now is I've been fiddling around with the motor hub uh, and section from the, uh, from the previous uh, fan that broke and the small assembly piece that was inside that. I'm not sure whether that's gonna focus, but yeah, the small assembly piece with inside it to see potentially if there's a bigger issue. Now, so I had to destroy the central clutch piece just to get these bits out to be able to understand more about them. I haven't actually got that anymore. I had to cut it into several pieces and that's an issue at the moment. But what I think is potentially being the problem being caused is that the, the clutch piece, because it was pushed down, or the clutch piece, the, uh, the center assembly there, because it was pushed down when I was putting the fan in, it was clipped to the fan and then pushed into place, uh, just the copper piece at the top uh, more more so. I think that piece is wedged in too proudly, uh, too proud of where it should be. I think it needs to be pushed further down and that might be rubbing against the slight raise in the center piece there and it might be the very slight grooves in there that is causing the sort of t -t 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 sound that I'm hearing. Um, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna heat it up and instead of pulling, I'm gonna be pushing down on the copper piece there. It's gonna look like I'm clamping down on the, uh, on the central piece, but I won't be. I'm gonna be having that just loosely around the center spindle piece and I'm gonna be pushing down on that copper section to see if it can sink further down. The further down the better and hopefully this will be the, uh, the final piece that I need to do to be able to uh, stop this sort of annoying t -t 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 sound happening. So that's the plan. That's the hope And if it doesn't work, then you'll know what I aim for and if it does work then yay We've learned something more. So let's see how that goes Oh my god, that, I think that worked. <sighs> okay, I think we're there. Jesus Christ. Right, let's put that in set fire to the floor. Okay, so I think that is it. I think that's all we need to do. I'm gonna go grab the fan blades, put them back on, and see how that worked. Now, if that is the case, this piece that I'm doing at the end of basically everything 
will need to go into the center somewhere, which is probably where you're going to see it, and this will sound like madness to you now. Um, so yeah, that's important. Getting that clutch piece right down into the center is going to be the next step rather than attaching it to the fan hub itself. So super like loads learned here, so much more than, than I could find anywhere on the internet. So hopefully this is going to be really ho really helpful for you guys. Uh, but yeah, getting that hub, that copper piece in the center right down into there seems to be exactly where it needs to be. So let's give it a test. Okay, let's see if this goes in nicely. And how much play is there? A hell of a lot less than there was before. That's what we want to see. Okay, a little bit of a correction on there required, but apart from that, I think we're all good. Of course, there's still the rubber feet to replace, and since the adhesive that was previously attached to these rubber feet was ruined in the process of removing them, we'll need to add a small strip of double back sellotape just to hold them in place. I'm only attaching these brown pads to the back of the fan since they're only needed to serve as a buffer to the cooler. But depending on what some of you think, I may also add them to the front to tribute to the origins of the fan. I don't know, maybe they might look good there. Okay, finally, last piece we've got to put in is this clip, and you can barely see it. So, well, if, well, if my finger wasn't there, you wouldn't be able to see it anyway, because it's black on black. Uh, the actual colour black actually sort of matches or suits quite well the black we've got going on here, so you'll barely notice the clip is there. Interestingly enough that they put a black clip in to hold in on top of a brown frame or a beige frame. But anyway, so just lay the cable down over the top, nothing fancy, and then push the clip in. Be very careful though, you don't want to end up scuffing the edges of, uh, of your paint job there and revealing any brown, so ideally some sort of really thin pliers would be what you'd want to use, but in this situation, I'm just going to try and wing it by pushing one end in and squeezing it across. Gotta get that wire out of the way though. There you go. So then that should be good to work in. Okay, and guaranteed if you were to remove that, you would see beige paint or beige plastic underneath the paint because there's no doubt scuffed something on the way through. And that's, that would be understandable, but it's in and it actually suits extremely well. Okay, this is sort of the, the pinnacle of, of this whole affair. Now, what I didn't do was weigh the fan blades of this spray paint job prior to the uh, prior to the original copy that I had, so the original blades themselves. But the previous spray paint job, I did that, and it turned out that the difference was about one gram, so we added about one gram of paint on there. Uh, on, this, um, on this version, though, I've got um, uh, more spray paint covers but of a gassier paint so I think they're not going to be too too, of a, too much of a disparity between them and also uh, we've got the lacquer on top so let's say that potentially we might have added an extra gram to the fan blades themselves potentially but what we're going to do now is actually weigh this one which is a 2200 um, rpm version which you can check out in that video I mentioned earlier but if we weigh that then that comes out at 72 grams total. We remove that off, and then we add on this one, which we've just painted. Got to make sure that that fan blade is, is on the weighing scale correctly. 73. So we've, and it was a 74, so perhaps one or two grams has been added to the overall weight of this fan. So that's, I mean, not really, well, it's, it's about 1% extra, I'd say. Uh, well, I'll do the actual maths and, and, and put that now in percent of percentage, but yeah, one gram out of 73 then, we've, we've added, you know, one and a bit uh, percent extra to the, uh, to the total mass of the fan. So we'll have to see how that copes in performance. I can't see it's gonna do a lot, but the one big question is, is obviously that's wrong now, so we can just turn that off. Um, obviously, we need to check the performance. Can't see doing a lot of difference, but we do need to keep in mind that all of this tampering we've been doing with the fan, we could have put some imbalance in. When it spins, it seems to be uh, completely fine. There doesn't seem to be much of an issue in, uh, in compared to that one. So I suppose we'll just have to test it and see how it does. No, that wasn't the real start, unfortunately. This might be the real start, fingers crossed. 
Oh yeah. Okay, so I've just popped into the BIOS now and the fan is running at 1100 RPM. Uh, 1130 it's wavering as fans do and the let's see the temperature of can I tell temperature of the CPU from this uh, motherboard temperature 26 CPU temperature 37 so it's 37 degrees and it's running at 1100 rpm it's on a fan curve so uh, that seems to be reasonable the question is when we turn this up to maximum does it hit 2500 rpm let's see Okay, so the maximum I've seen so far is, well, 2509 just then. It was 2490, uh, 2513. It's clearly hitting its marks. So you can check that out now. Uh, so it would appear that we haven't got any fan-based performance. Now, potentially there is some, I don't know, uh, air, air <laughs> aerodynamical performance, essentially. Uh, aerodynamic lost due to the surface that we've put on instead of the, the surface that was there before. So... The only way you can really test that is, does it cool like it used to before? And we tested this prior uh, with the huge CPU roundup test, uh, huge for this channel, and we did about uh, eight different CPU coolers. So we're gonna retest this with this new one, 2547 just there, and see if it performs just as well as it did before. As far as I'm concerned, I can't see it performing any less. Also, I did hear some slight little crackling noises from it. It's it's like a uh, air pockets or something like that. The sound of that. That might be because the uh, the lubricant inside is working its way round and uh, and exposing these air pockets and allowing the air to uh, go out and replace itself with the lubricant we added in afterwards. We did add more than there was before in terms of lubricant, so uh, we'll just have to see how it goes. I will be editing with this for the whole video, so if anything does go wrong and fail at the end, then I will certainly let you know. That should give this enough time to settle in uh, into its sort of new setup. So uh, by I mean setup, we just dismantled it and reassembled it. So let's get on to testing and see how it does. Okay, so let's break down this and the following graphs. To the left is the results for the NHL9i with the original fan, and to the right are the results for the NHL9i with the painted fan. I'm calling it the AVBLK Noctua NHL9i. I'm, I'm sure there's some sort of legal issue behind that. The purple bars represent cooler height, which is purely a legacy piece of information from other graphs, so we can basically ignore it. And the blue bar represents maximum CPU delta T results, which is resulting from the maximum CPU temperature from the test minus the ambient temperature of the room it's being tested in. This means you can directly compare these values that you see without any other work. It's also worth pointing out that the room temperature was around 21 degrees C, so you could also add that to the temperature values you see here to get a rough idea of the real temperature. You could also add your room temperature's values to get an understanding of how hot it would be if you tested it in your room. And if I encounter any performance drops, such as frames per second drops or thermal throttling, I'll be sure to show you and let you know. And finally, I know I'm going on, I'm going to be showing you the results from all of the tests in order of testing. You'll understand why in a minute. Anyway, sorry for the long explanation, I wanted to get all of that straight before heading in, so here we go. The 10 minute Prime95 small FFTS test had the painted fan trailing only 0.3 degrees C hotter than the original. You might be able to make out from the sped up footage in the background, not of this test but recorded background footage from another time, that it only takes around 3 minutes to hit equilibrium. Going through the fire strike tests, graphics test 1, not a CPU intensive test, shows a 0.7 degrees C increase from the black painted fans cooler. Graphics test 2 shows the opposite with a 1.3 degrees C cooler CPU with the black painted fan. A back and forth can be expected when results are this close and this could all be down to the tolerance of the test. The physics test, more CPU intensive, shows the CPU 0.3 degrees C cooler with the black fan. And the combined test shows the CPU being 0.7 degrees C hotter with the black fan, so nothing too conclusive found through Firestrike. How about Unigen Heaven? Well, the black fan cooled CPU turned out to be 0.8 degrees C hotter here. Unigen Superposition came up with some really weird results, showing the black fan CPU cooler to be 2.4 degrees C cooler. I reran the test to see if it was repeatable, and it turns out it was right. Maybe I messed up something with the original fan test. Moving on. Dirt 3 shows the black fan CPU to be 1.7 degrees C cooler. Not as weird as the Superposition result, but still quite a difference. 
Dirt Showdown gives us a 5.5 degree C cooler CPU with the black fan. This is getting stranger and stranger. I perform these tests more than once every time to eliminate weirdness like this. Rise of the Tomb Raider shows the black fan CPU to be 1.5 degrees C cooler. This could be tolerance, but it seems to be following the trend. Hitman pushes the trend a little further with a 3.6 degrees C difference, the black fan CPU here being the cooler one. And finally, GTA shows us a slightly more reasonable 0.6 degrees C cooler black fan CPU. Okay, so wrapping things up, going over those results, you would have thought that if you were to tamper with a fan, mess around with it, and, you know, tinker with the professionally built fan, that you would decrease the performance, if not, not increase it at all. But for some reason, there was an increase in performance. Now, think back to earlier on when I specifically told you I'm showing you all of the, all of the results that I tested, which I wouldn't normally do. I'd normally select the uh, select few of them that made sense to show, that showed more uh, increases or decrease in performance. But I specifically showed you every test that I did in in the order that it was tested. Now, initially, Prime 95 started off with a 0.3 degrees uh, reduction in performance. Now, 0.3 degrees isn't a lot, it's kind of tolerance. Uh, it was Delta T, so it wasn't tolerance within the room temperature, but, you know, testing tolerance here and there. If it just had a slightly, you know, higher spike for some reason, if Windows decided to throw something at it, then it might have maybe gone a little bit higher and, you know, or a, bit, a little bit lower for some reason. But, that could be testing tolerance there. Now, we saw a sort of, you know, a sort of reduction in the trends for the first couple of tests, you know, uh, Fire Strike wasn't very conclusive at all, very up and down, but then we started seeing a fall off from the performance of the, of the uh, original fan. Now, the only thing that I can think that has perhaps affected this is the oil that we put in. We put in a different type of oil. We put a three-in-one oil and I think we put in more than there were originally was. So perhaps over time this might deprove the performance or de decrease the performance back to a standard level. But perhaps this oil is perhaps more suited to continuous use. I mean, it is designed to go into cars, into hinges, and onto bicycles, which, you know, uh, have uh, parts that spin up uh, for a very long time with much higher pressures uh, against them, such as, you know, um, uh, the, the cog assembly or the, uh, the gear assembly of a bike has much higher pressures on it in terms of lateral pressures than a fan does. Um, you know, it's lots of steel, lots of force being applied and it's not plastic and, you know, very little force being applied. So maybe this can deal with the longer term testing such as uh, 40 to 50 minutes of continuous full speed of, you know, 2500, 2600 RPM. So that's kind of the only way I can think that the, the, that improvement uh, was there because the, the solution there being that, or the reason there being that the uh, the original lubricant just isn't designed to last for 20, for full speed for an entire hour, let's say. It's probably designed to deal with, you know, full speed bursts here and there for 10 minutes here and there, but nothing like an entire hour of full speed, uh, perhaps where this might improve. So I've gone over that a couple of times now to stop repeating myself. So that's the only way I can think that that, that was the improvement. It's repeatable as well. I repeat every single test with every single fan and case that I, I do a couple of times over, if not a few times over, if I see, you know, weird disparities between the testing results. Uh, so yeah, that's, that's really all I can say that that is the difference. If not, we can completely disregard any of the improvements we saw and say it performed the same. It's up to you. You can you can look at it either way. It was either an improvement or it was the same. So that's pretty much it. Anyway, let's wrap this video up entirely now. It's something like 40 minutes, which I never intend to hit as high as, uh, as I normally do, but I do feel things need explaining properly. And, you know, that's what, what this video is all about. So, if you want to support this video, then you can give it a like. If you want to support the channel, you can subscribe to the channel. If you want to go further than that, you can subscribe to the Twitch channel. We do live streams here and there of case builds. We actually did this case build, uh, or, or this build, system build, in this case, on a live stream, just as a bit of fun. Uh, and you can also, if you want to go even further than that, join the Patreon and add... Uh, or just, oh or send a dollar a month over to support the channel in getting cases and, you know, supporting the losses we get from, you know, buying cases and selling cases and that sort of thing. But don't feel you need to. All these videos are free. And when the um, when the advertisement comes back at some point, then potentially uh, we'll be able to support ourselves a little better from that. We used to be able to, but not anymore. Hopefully when that happens, it'll come back. And if we get advertising back at some point when you're watching this, you could always sponsor this channel. There's this new sponsor button that I haven't got access to because we're still waiting after still two months for YouTube to get their act together and 
re uh, remonetize this channel. So, um, by, by the way, the remonetization wasn't because I did something wrong. It's because it was below a thousand subscribers, 950 at the close off date. And only a week later, it became a thousand. And then I had to wait over probably about four months now when it gets to the point I'm subscribed or remonetized to get a monetization back. Anyway, I've gone way too far. Thank you so much for checking this video out. I hope it was extremely useful. If you have any questions about any of it, please let me know in the comments and I will do my best to help you out. Or hit me up on Facebook and I generally answer every question that comes to me there. Thanks for watching and I will catch you in the next one. Bye bye.